Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of werewolf horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. I saw a big black wolf with red eyes. As the title states I saw a big black wolf with glowing red eyes in the middle of the afternoon when I was younger. I was outside of my grandmother's house playing. I ran around to the front yard and on the right side of the house I this this creature. It just stood there and didn't move at all. Being young it terrified me and I ran away. Curiosity was also a major factor so about 15 seconds after I ran away I went back to where I saw it and it was gone. She had a fenced in backyard and where it was standing I would have seen it leave the property. This wasn't in a rural area either. This was in a suburb in Connecticut. Very big and busy town. Right near the town green. I've searched the internet for years for what this might have been, but I have never found anyone having a similar experience. I've read tales of similar creatures in dreams or whatnot, but never one of them out in a suburb in the middle of the afternoon on a sunny day. Also, it might be important to add that my grandmother did witchcraft or black magic. I don't know if there's even a difference between the two. There was another time me and my younger brother were inside my grandmother's house, and we were walking up the stairs. Keep in mind this is a very old house with a chapel in it with the stained glass window and everything. Three quarters of the way up the stairs we see the literal grim reaper walk from the right side, and stop at the top of the stairs and stare at us. We both stopped and looked at each other at exactly the same time, so I know it wasn't our imagination. It then walked into a bedroom on the left. We ran down those stairs faster than you'd think children can run. I don't know if these two encounters could be related in some way. If anyone has any information on what these things could have been, or what it meant, or anything please tell me. I am 25 now and have been wondering for years what those creatures were. And this isn't one of those made up creepy pastas to scare people. This is legit. Any info is appreciated. Second story. My husband developed an extreme version of werewolf syndrome. My husband of six years, Troy, was diagnosed with hypertrichosis during the last leg of our marriage. If that particular disorder doesn't ring a bell, you may recognize it by its more colloquially friendly name of werewolf syndrome. Due to the furry, lupin appearance it can give the afflicted. It's pretty rare, and it took us completely by surprise, given that no one in Troy's family ever had it. It turns out it can be acquired without a genetic predisposition. At first, it was a little funny. Thick, dark brown hair distinct from Troy's normal dirty blonde hair and scraggly gingerish beard, began to sprout his luxurious mutton chops by his ears and along his cheekbones. He let it go for a bit, then shaved it all off once the wolverine jokes got old. We didn't worry too much about it. It was strange, sure, but we figured it would be manageable. The hair grew back quickly though, and the same dark, downy fuzz began to grow elsewhere on Troy's body, his shoulders, back, stomach, and perhaps most disturbingly, his palms and the soles of his feet. Once that began, the hair only seemed to grow faster, like overnight fast. After I woke up with some of his foot hair twisted around my ankle, I took Troy to see a doctor. It was the first time I'd seen Dr. Brighton, our family doctor of several years, appear to be shocked by anything. He did his best not to show it, which is exactly how I knew he was so disturbed. Dr. Brighton was usually warm and gregarious, and as soon as he saw Troy I watched his face go carefully blank. You rarely see hypertrichosis to this extent, he said as we consulted in his small, sterile office. It's quite unmanageable. He's growing hair back overnight, I answered, giving Troy a sideways glance. He was twirling a long lock of hair from his forearm with his index finger. 
I tried to keep from shuddering. We've resorted to trimming it all as quickly as possible before bed. It's not really helping. I see, Dr. Brighton said, jotting a note down on a clipboard. Well, there are options, such as electrolysis or laser hair removal. My concern is the extent to which you would need such therapies. They can be expensive and sometimes painful, even for areas of minor concentration. He glanced at Troy, but his eyes didn't seem to want to linger long. He began writing again. It's not that bad, honestly, Troy chimed in. A little itchy at times, and yeah, I've gotten a lot of funny looks. Other than that, I don't know. I think I could live with it. Well, that's the spirit, Dr. Brighton replied, though his eyes twitched to me briefly before they went back to Troy. Just keep it all clean and dry, and I'm sure you'll be all right. If you ever want to seek out permanent treatment, I can give you some recommendations. Thanks, Doc, Troy said, hopping off the examination table. We'll let you know. A week later, Troy's body was absolutely covered in hair. It had to be a one in a zillion occurrence. Not even the most egregious case I could find pictures of on Google could compare. Troy wasn't all that shy about his appearance either, and insisted on accompanying me on even the most mundane of outings. News about his condition spread almost as quickly as the hair. There was an article in the local paper that dubbed him the city's own real-life Sasquatch, and after that, he was a minor celebrity. People stopped to ask for photos and requests for his best Wookiee impression. I found this all very hard to cope with. I loved my husband more than anything, but it was becoming too much. Being near him was like being around a perpetually damp, odorous dog. All that hair made him sweat, and by the end of the day, he smelled like the communal towel of a sauna frequented exclusively by 400-pound men. Needless to say, the one accommodation I asked him to make was to sleep separately from me. There was nothing less restful than lying next to the human equivalent of a yak. Troy had to stop working as things spiraled out of control. He spent most of his days sleeping on the couch and watching TV, content in his cocoon of hair. Meanwhile, I took on a second job to keep up with the mortgage and living expenses, including the increased cost of shears, shampoo, and other supplies. I would be exhausted and at the end of my rope after two shifts, all while hacking at a jungle of increasingly tangled and unruly hair. One night while I was especially tired, I was trimming a wild mat on Troy's thigh, humming to keep myself awake. I had just snipped off a clump when I felt something creeping around my wrist. I screeched and yanked back when I noticed a twist of hair encircling my wrist and snaking up my forearm. Ow! What the hell, Carrie? Troy demanded. Why are you pulling? I wedged the trimming scissors under the hair and snipped it away. I watched as it receded like a wounded snake. Stunned, I took a step back. I'm totally losing my mind, Troy. I need to sleep. It's going to be even worse tomorrow if you don't finish, he warned. I stared at my hirsute husband. Troy, I don't think I can do this. I'm at my wit's end. Carrie, don't say that. I need you. In sickness and in health, remember? Let's talk about it tomorrow, I sighed with a shake of my head. Sorry, I'm just so tired. Troy was quiet for a moment as I swept the trimmings. Can I sleep in bed with you? He asked. I don't know. It's so hot with all the hair. Please, Carrie. It might be the last time. His words tugged my heartstrings, and the desperate look in his eyes did the rest. My throat felt dry and strained at the thought of lying next to him, but I nodded anyway. I was too tired to argue. I helped Troy up the stairs and to our bedroom. I got under the covers, while he laid on top, having his own natural blanket of sorts. He drifted off quickly with gentle snores, and I turned away, curling up to be as far away from him as possible. 
With the thought of the retreating, worm-like hairs and a final disturbed shiver, I too fell asleep. I had wretched dreams of a deep, dark jungle with slithering, living vines that ensnared me. They dragged me into a fetid swamp where an alligator lay in wait to snap and crunch off each of my limbs, one by one. Just as the monster was about to go for my head, I gasped myself awake. I thought the nightmare itself had awoken me, but it wasn't that. It was the pain from the loss of circulation in my arms and legs. I pulled and flailed, my limbs meeting resistance, and was finally able to thrust the covers down to my midsection. I saw with horror that my arms had been bound tightly with thick ropes of Troy's hair. With no way to free myself, I began to panic. Troy! I hissed, beating down the desire to scream. Wake up! You have to help me. Troy stirred without opening his eyes. What's wrong? He mumbled. Your hair is tangled all over me. I need you to get it off. Oh, sorry about that, he responded. I felt the hair restraining me begin to shift and release, falling away from my body, harmless as ribbons. Oh my God, I gasped, scrambling out of bed and backing away. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. What? Troy asked, more annoyed than alarmed. He'd finally opened his eyes, and that's when I began to scream. Thready patches of hair had sprouted from the whites of his eyes. They wriggled and floated like tentacles while he looked at me. When he blinked, the hairs seemed to curl and retract under his eyelids. That's it. I shrieked dressing frantically. I have to leave. I can't take it anymore. Carrie, don't. We can figure it out. I'll see Dr. Brighton again. I'll start treatment. I promise. Troy, I don't think you have hypertrichosis. Whatever you have, it's much worse. I'm sorry. I grabbed an overnight bag from our closet and began shoving everything I could find into it. I have to go. I started for the bedroom door, but thick tendrils of hair suddenly whipped out and wrapped firmly around my waist, pulling me back. Don't leave, Carrie. Troy pleaded. I can't do this alone. The rope around my waist squeezed uncomfortably, and I lost my wind for a second. I didn't have anything to cut it away and was getting scared. I took a second to calm myself before speaking again. Okay. I'll stay. Just let me go grab the scissors, and I'll be back in a minute. I'll call off of work, and we'll try and sort this out. Troy's hair fell from my waist. He appeared mostly placated, but that appearance was betrayed when he used his hair to lift the overnight back out of my reach. Promise? Of course, I said, smiling with trembling lips. He let me go. I went downstairs calmly, picked up the scissors, then my keys and my cell phone, and bolted out the front door. I heard Troy's yells even as I was starting my car. I screeched out of the driveway and took off without ever looking in the rearview mirror. I never stepped foot into that house again. I fled to my home state of Illinois, where my parents still resided. They took back their 35-year-old daughter with grace and love which helped my mental state tremendously. I blocked Troy's number and deleted the voicemails I received from Dr. Brighton. After a couple of months of living at home, I had no idea what had become of Troy, and that was exactly how I preferred it. My wedding ring was banished to a safety deposit box and all but forgotten. Half a year after leaving, I had a good job again and rented my own apartment. I mostly avoided developing friendships or romantic interests. I didn't need the complication of others asking about my past personal life, dredging up old horrors. I did, however, adopt a very sweet and companionable mutt named Archer. We kept life simple, and sometimes the nightmare of Troy faded into the background of my memory. There, but not all-consuming. That all changed yesterday. 
I was rudely awoken at 3 a.m. by a cacophony consisting of my phone ringing and Archer barking like a rabid hound. Groggily, I sat up and picked up my cell. It was Dr. Brighton calling. I let it go to voicemail, then listened to the message. Carrie, the doctor said, his tone steady and serious. I hope this message finds you well. I just wanted to let you know something. I went to visit Troy earlier today, and he wasn't at the house. He'd been threatening to find you for a while, but I didn't think it was physically possible for him to leave the house at this point. There was a brief pause. Look, keep your head on a swivel, Carrie. He comes from a place of love, but, well, just be safe. He's changed quite a lot. Call me back if you need anything, and take care of yourself. The message ended, and I put down the phone. First grabbing the scissors I always kept on the nightstand. I left the bedroom to go check on Archer. He was standing in the hallway. His little black and gray speckled body pointed directly at the front door. He was growling, low and long, with raised hackles. A mass of thin, dark tendrils was poking in through the cracks of the door frame, creeping over the door and across the hardwood as an alien mass. Archer snapped at it, but a few strands got hold of his front paw and began to drag him forward. He yelped, sliding on the floor as he tried to get away. Don't you fucking touch my dog. I screamed and lunged at the hair to hack at it with the scissors. Once freed, Archer ran behind me, whimpering. From somewhere far off, I thought I heard a yell, and I noticed something extremely disturbing from the clippings on the floor. They were leaking small amounts of what appeared to be blood. The hairs I'd cut curled and retreated back through the door like wounded creatures. I would like to say that I considered the pain I would cause the former love of my life before I cut anymore. But that would be a lie. With a guttural cry, I began hacking relentlessly at the invading strands like a deranged barber and again heard distant sounds of anguish. The remaining hair disappeared quickly after my attack and I was left staring at the mess of trimmings and red stains, shocked beyond reason. I stayed up, on watch for any further intrusion, with Archer by my side the entire time. When day broke, I went to the police station to file a formal restraining order against Troy. Of course, omitting the part about the supernatural control he had over his own hair. I think Archer and I will move again soon. It's probably a stalemate at this point, given that I now know that Troy's strength is also his weakness, but I'm not taking any chances. In the meantime, I've spent most of a paycheck on the sharpest shears I can find, and a whole shelf's worth of nair. Troy, if by some chance you read this, I have one message for you. Find me again, and I won't hold back. I'm ready for you, you hairy bastard. Third Story the Wichita Werewolf. Growing up here I was always greeted by friendly people. Everyone said hi and waved to each other. You had your neighbors over on Sunday after church for a barbecue, and everyone had a good time. Of course, being a kid I was very curious and would explore while my parents were visiting with people from church. One afternoon my friends and I played hide and seek. I had the bright idea to sneak down to the southern part of my neighborhood which was run down. The farther and farther I got from my house the darker the road became due to the foliage above blocking out the sun. The paved street turned to a dirt road. White picket fence turned into overgrown yards and abandoned houses. I found a hiding spot underneath an old pickup truck with weeds growing through the bed and cab. I was invisible to the naked eye. About ten minutes passed and I could barely make out the conversations and laughter several houses down at the barbecue, as well as the screaming and commotion whenever one of my friends was found. Behind me I heard a stick break, but I didn't dare look. It was probably my friend Clay trying to find me. Suddenly two denim-clad legs appeared in front of my face, barefoot but far too hairy to be any of my friends. I kept quiet. 
As the knees bent, I was met with an older man with two different colored eyes. What in the Sam hell are you doing down there, Boa? I'm hiding from my friends, I managed to reply. I crawled out from under the truck and realized I had never seen this man ever before. I was taught at a young age to have exceptional manners and introduced myself. The old man asked me if I wanted to come back to his house enticing me with his recipe of homemade cornbread. Again, I retained my manners and kindly refused. Instead of being persistent the old man nodded and told me to go and play with my friends. By this time Clay saw me and started to head over. I walked towards him while motioning the timeout signal. Why ain't you hiding? He exclaimed. I told Clay how I was hiding until some man found me and I pointed back but the man was gone. Nowhere to be found. As Clay was pestering me. Claiming I stopped the game because I couldn't find a good hiding spot. I was staring at the old truck where I was hiding. The grass and weeds were much too thick that even standing here glaring at where I had been I wouldn't be able to see myself. How did that man ever manage to see me? I finally convinced Clay that what happened was true, but Ryan and Jacob or even Bo didn't seem to believe me or really care too much. Clay and I saw the man again but this time he was walking down the dirt road on the south side of the neighborhood and walked into one of the houses we had always assumed was vacant. We had to investigate. The big cottonwood outside the house had squirrel bones stuck to the trunk as well as a reflective light like you'd find on a bicycle nail to either side. The man's house had a ripped screen door, as well as two big moths that crawled the wall by a cracked window. I can't believe he lives here, Clay whispered. Where did he come from anyway? I asked. We turned around facing the dirt road. It was a no outlet road, and at the end there was a fence that read, No Trespassing. Of course, two kids, we trespassed. As we climbed over the fence a chill ran down my spine. Dread filled my ever being but I didn't want to seem like a wuss to clay so I manned up and kept my composure. Through the trees and thickets we found a tattered old house that looked like it had been hit by the tornado a few years back. Next to it an old shed with a broken out window. On the ground around it looked like blood. Was it paint? Blood? From an animal? Back farther was a railroad track, and passed at the other side of town, so we decided to go back to Clay's house. I could tell Clay also wanted to leave as much as I did. Fall swept in, bringing with it the sweet aroma of dead leaves and crisp morning air. It was still warm, but much more bearable than the summer. School had started so playing with my neighborhood friends became something of a rarity, only hanging out on weekends or if we finished our homework, at night. We had always enjoyed catching lightning bugs or playing in the treehouse at night, but this particular fall all of our parents would usually limit how often we went over to each other's houses. The Southern Plains area of the U.S. is notorious for its human trafficking, but the autumn of 2004 was something else entirely. It all started when a kid from the west side went missing. The police simply thought the kid got lost, but when they started their investigation the trail went cold. The next week a Baptist church down a couple blocks away from our road was having a fundraiser. Two children from there also went missing. Was there some sort of connection? At night I could swear I heard some sort of howling, followed by all of the dogs in my neighborhood barking. My father dismissed it telling me I was hearing coyotes, and that there weren't no wolves in Kansas. I knew what coyotes sounded like. We often encountered them while hunting. Parents do their best to keep their children from finding out how terrible the world can be. Their attempt was futile on the night of October 23rd. I was playing at Clay's house, along with my friend Ryan and Bo. He had quite the collection of toys, both new and hand-me-downs from his older brother. At around 9 p.m. Clay's parents get a call, and we hear footsteps coming towards the top of the stairs, which one of our parents wants us home. Who's the first to go? Jacob, your father wants you to come home now, proclaimed Clay's mom. 
We all froze and exchanged glances making sure we didn't miss Jacob, as if he had been under our noses the entire time. W what? Hollered Clay. Apparently he has a test tomorrow morning, answered Clay's dad. My stomach sank. Us four boys met Clay's mom at the stairs. Jacob never came over Jacob isn't here, we all muttered. Clay's mom gave us a stern look of disapproval thinking we were pranking her before her face gave way to a horrific grimace. She picked the phone back up off the hook, dialing back Jacob's parents. Through the phone, down the stairs I could still hear the petrified voice of Jacob's mom. Police asked us questions. If Jacob had told us about any people he recently met, the last time any of us spoke to him, etc. They asked if we had seen anything strange recently to which we had all seen the strange man so we told the investigators about him. Well, even if we knew where he lived, we don't know if he is the one behind this, Clay, and I told the officer what house he was living in. Son, the officer was looking at Clay. No one's lived in that house for years. It's abandoned. The investigator told our parents they'd keep an eye out for a man who matched our description. The cops didn't seem to genuine about it, though. So it's a good thing, Clay, and I didn't mention anything else like the creepy shed, Plus, we weren't supposed to be back there in the first place. Halloween, a time of pretend spookiness and celebrating with candy, was instead filled with absolutely terrified families and mourning parents. Across the town, more kids had never returned with sacks full of candy. The investigation was stepped up, and the police had suspects, but one after the other, they all were cleared. Hunting season had taken my mind off of the recent tragedy. It was hard to tell, but my father was quite uneasy about this whole ordeal. It was almost like he was taking me out into the wilderness to keep me safe. We'd go hunting quite a bit, me and him. One night my father and I were heading back home. In the rear view mirror I saw a beautiful sunset, the pond mirroring it, and the branches blowing in the stiff breeze. Maybe this whole thing will just pass over, I thought. Still missing Jacob. When I got home, I saw police lights flickering and the cops outside of Clay's house. No. I cried out loud. My father and mother embraced me as Clay's parents embraced each other. Empty inside. It's been 15 years since that fall, and this all still remains a mystery. Fourth story. My father has the curse of the dog man. There was a running joke in my family for many years. It was always the ladies who said it, never the men. As if the guys were in on some secret the women didn't know about. There goes the werewolf. My mother and aunts would say his grandpa was going out the door, hat in hand. He always disappears on full moons and never comes back until the morning. As children we would laugh along with them, not understanding the true reasons for his leaving. The years went on and my grandfather, who I called my opa, kept disappearing on full moons until he was no longer able to walk. Soon after that he was admitted to the hospital and came down with a bad infection, passing away a short while later from a myriad of complications. Strangely, after his death, my dad took up the tradition of disappearing during full moons. He never did it before Opa passed away, but suddenly he started exhibiting the exact same behavior. I'm heading out, he would say to my mother, putting on his coat and leaving the house right before sunset. I'll see you in the morning. Again? You really are turning into your father. My mom would call after him as he hurried down the porch steps, sometimes jogging or running as if late for an appointment. She didn't realize how right she was. Asterisk. Eventually I moved away and went to college, found a girlfriend and got engaged, married, and bought a house. If you want to sum up my entire life in one sentence, I guess that about does it. Except something happened recently, derailing that one sentence description of my existence and turning it into a rambling run-on with no end in sight. My father called and told me he needed to talk to me about something. He said it was important and couldn't wait. 
I needed to come over right away. What is it? I asked, once we were finally alone in his basement man cave. He poured two glasses of scotch halfway to the brim, then added a bit more for good measure. He handed me one of the glasses and I took it, eyeing him suspiciously. I don't drink, I reminded him. Trust me, you'll want that. He sat down on a leather chair across from me, the fire roaring beside him. I took a tentative sip and winced at the burn, smacking my lips to try and appreciate the taste, then set the glass down on the table beside me. I've been trying to keep this from you for as long as possible. I have to tell you something important about your Opa. Opa's been dead for years, I smiled nervously. You're not losing your memory, are you, Dad? My memory is fine. Just listen, okay? Your Opa had a secret, and now it's my secret, and I have to pass it on to you. It's important, okay? Just trust me. All right, I said nervously, and took another sip of the drink. The burn wasn't as bad this time, and was more like a warmth that coated my throat and sizzled in my stomach. You remember how Opa always disappeared on full moons? Did you ever wonder why he did it? and why I started doing it right after he died. It had been a while since I'd thought about this. I had just accepted it as part of life at a certain point, like a strange paternal family tradition. I had semi-forgotten my dad's odd habit of escaping the house on full moons. Looking back at his face, I was surprised by how many new wrinkles had formed around his eyes when I hadn't been paying attention. It occurred to me how often I looked at him without really looking at him. I always thought it was an excuse for you to get out with the guys, to go drinking, or to the strip club or something. Some of my friends tried to convince me you were in a cult, but I told them that was ridiculous. I thought about whether or not I should say my last thought, and it slipped out anyways. A guy at college said you were probably in the mafia. I looked at his somber face and felt my chest grow tighter. Then he burst out laughing, breaking the tension. I laughed along with him, still feeling that stone of dread in my belly. I'm not in a cult. Or the mafia. Okay, well, what is it then? His face turned grave again. He took a sip of his drink. Then he took another, and another. Finally, after several more long moments of silence, he stood up. Let's go for a walk, he said. You need to see it to believe it. I followed after him reluctantly. My father took me out to the woods behind his house, which led deep into a forested wilderness that stretched on for a long, long ways. There was no path, but he seemed to know exactly where he was going, as he trudged through thick grass and brush, leading me deeper and deeper into the woods. What the hell are we doing out here? I asked him, slapping at a mosquito which landed on my neck, leaving a pool of blood on my palm. You'll see, was all he would say. We walked for a long time, mostly without conversation, through the dark forest, far from the path. Finally, we reached my father's intended destination, a little clearing with a few logs situated around a fire pit. It was evening and sunset was an hour or so away. A full moon was waiting bloated behind the horizon. I glanced over and was alarmed to see a few chains attached to a tree nearby. My eyes traced down the length of them to a set of steel manacles. Dad, what are those chains for? I asked, getting scared. He must have heard the fear in my voice and tried to reassure me. It's okay, son, he said, his eyes locked onto mine. You know I would never hurt you, in a million years, right? I nodded. Good, now I need you to trust me. Can you do that? Can you trust me? I nodded again, tears welling up in my eyes for reasons I didn't understand. Listen, we have a bit of time. There's no big rush. That's why I brought you out here early. There's a few things I need to tell you, and some are gonna be easier to believe than others, but they're all true. And when I ask you to, well, 
When I ask you to do what I need you to do, I need you to not ask any questions. I need you to just do it and trust me, okay? I guess. As long as it's not too crazy, I said, trying to keep it together. Just tell me already. I'm dying of suspense over here. He motioned for me to sit on one of the logs next to the fire pit. I did so, and he began to build a fire. Despite his age, he could still do it quicker than anyone I'd ever met. I watched him set it alight, and it roared up in an instant inferno. He sat down on a log and his eyes met mine again. My soul felt like it was leaving my body as he spoke his next words. I'm dying, son. It's the big C. I couldn't even respond. All I could do was sit there with my mouth hanging open, staring across the fire at him. The embers popped and sparks flew into the air between us. It's in my colon, which means it's everywhere else too, according to the doctors. They did the tests, gave me a few options. Chemo and radiation will extend my life, probably, but no guarantees. And there would be side effects. I saw how that went with your grandmother, and I'm not gonna go through that. Which means I'm gonna finish things au natural. I opened my mouth to speak, but he cut me off before I could say a word. It's my choice so don't argue. They're giving me a few months, at most. Maybe less. I don't know how I'm gonna look in a week or a month, and so I need to tell you all of this now, while I still can. While my mind is still sharp, you understand. I was in shock, unsure of what to say. It wouldn't sink in for several more days. So at that moment I just stood up and gave him a big hug, squeezing him tight until he made a pain noise. For the first time, I noticed how thin he'd gotten lately. My arms used to have trouble making it all the way around his waist, but now I felt his ribs and the lack of a belly. Again, I'd been looking at him but not really seeing him for a while. What else do you need to tell me? I said. After saying all of the other things that you say when someone you love tells you they're dying. It sounded important, whatever it was. About Opa? He nodded, looking solemn. Yeah, unfortunately that's even worse news. I really don't want to tell you about this. I have no choice though. You have to understand that I tried. And there is no way out of it. Like the cancer, it's a part of me. It's a part of us. Just remember, no matter what, that I tried. You don't need to go through that, okay? This is a curse, an irreversible one, that has been passed down to my side of the family and my side alone. Only the men are afflicted with it, never the women. We try to keep it from them, so they don't have to live with the guilt and the pain that we do. I prayed for your mother to have a girl. You have to believe me. I prayed you would not be born into this. What are you talking about, Dad? The cancer? Are you saying that's some sort of family curse? That's crazy. I mean, genetics play a part, I'm sure. But it's not Dash. No. He cut me off. We can die from diseases just like any mortal. The stories are all wrong about that. We are merely men with a terrible curse. I waited for him to explain in plain English and hoped that eventually he would get around to it. The sun was drawing closer and closer to the horizon and that felt like an important detail for some reason. Like an hourglass running out of sand. He stood up and pointed to his belt. It was old and I realized it was the same one my grandfather had worn. There was a silver wolf head which comprised the buckle. This belt is special, son. It holds an ancient power. It was passed down to me by my father, your Opa, and it was given to him by his father before him, going back for hundreds and hundreds of years. This belt is what gives us our power, but it also carries with it a great curse. I stared at him, wondering what the hell he could possibly be talking about. Just listen, he said, as if reading my mind. In about half an hour you won't need to believe my words, you'll see it for yourself. It's a full moon tonight, Jason. 
And that means I'm going to turn into something else. A thing that's not quite a man and not quite a wolf. It's somewhere in between. What? I nearly screamed. That's insane. Dad, this is all nuts. I thought maybe the cancer was affecting his mind. What other reason could there be for such a bizarre lie? Instead of debating with me, he just continued as if I hadn't spoken. This belt is a symbol of our power, but it is more than that. It carries with it our strength and our curse. If you should ever lose it, it will haunt you. Every death you see on the news will be your burden to bear, for you have forsaken your sworn duty. The dead will come to you in your dreams, and you will never truly rest again. Hear my words, son, and remember them. I sat back down on the wooden log, landing hard on my ass and nearly toppling it over. Dad, come on. You're kidding me, right? Is this a joke? He shook his head. I wish it was, son, but it's very real, and I'm going to prove it to you. No, Dad. You don't have to do that. I yelled, but he ignored me. He stood up and walked over to the tree where chains and manacles were attached. I followed after him, running to catch up. Despite his age, he could still move quickly, and the fire he had started was still roaring behind us, and I had no concerns about tending it to keep it going. It was blazing high, and he had already stacked a pile of wood nearby to feed it, as if planning to stay here for a while. Or maybe, it occurred to me, he was thinking that I would want to stay for a while here with him. I can lock these ones, but I need you to do the last one, my father said, putting the handcuffs around his ankles and wrists. He snapped them shut and locked them with a key. I noticed they hung loosely around his wrists and he could easily escape them. But maybe, just maybe, a voice in my mind said, he would grow into them. Come on, we're running out of time, he said, and I noticed for the first time that the sun had set and it would be dark soon. It was twilight now, and there was very little light remaining. An orange full moon was cresting large on the horizon. Normally I would argue with him, but I could tell he was serious and would be very upset if I tried. Feeling numb, I went over to the steel bracelet on his left wrist and locked it with the key he handed me. Then I stood back, surveying the strange scene. Mosquitoes were buzzing and landing on my neck and I slapped at them, wishing I'd brought bug spray. They were landing on my dad too, but he didn't seem to notice them. This is gonna get ugly, he said. Whatever I do, don't try to help me. Don't try to assist me in any way. It's gonna look like I'm in pain, and I am going to be in some pain, but it will only last for a short while, and then I'll be myself again. I opened my mouth to say something and closed it again. What the hell could I say? Dad, you don't have to do this, I tried. Whatever is happening to you, I'm sure it's not Dash. A noise interrupted my speech, and I realized that it was the sound of clothing being torn. It was his shirt. The skin underneath was bulging and growing like a tumorous lump, but then it smoothed out and spread turning into a growing ripple of muscle. It stretched down the length of his left arm, hairs bristling out from his skin along the way, following the path of its growth. His left arm now fits snugly in the handcuff which I had assumed was too large for him. He winced and bared his teeth from a sudden pain, letting out a low noise. I reached forward to put my hand on his shoulder. Get back, he roared and his voice sounded different now, lower and thicker like the growl of a dog. I stumbled backwards, startled and terrified, and tripped over a branch, landing hard on my back. My head whipped into a rock and bounced up and down a couple times before settling in the dirt. Pain bloomed back there, and I saw stars explode throughout the darkness of my vision. It's possible I passed out momentarily, or for more than a few minutes. When I opened my eyes all I could think about was the sharp ache in the back of my skull. 
I reached back to feel the warmth of blood on my hand and held it up to my face to see how bad it was. But it was too dark to tell. I looked down to see my head had collided with a rock which was embedded into the forest floor. The stars were out in the night sky above, but they were not as visible due to the brightness of the full moon and the canopy of swaying tree branches above. Struggling to rise to my feet, I looked to see a creature which appeared to be a werewolf chained to a tree nearby. It stood on its hind legs, flexing and straining against the chains which bound it to the tree. It snapped its teeth and fixed its eyes on me. The dirt at the base of the tree buckled and crunched as if he might lift the whole thing out from the dirt. But the roots held firm and a second later the creature relaxed slightly, its snout sniffing at the air, smelling my blood on the wind. Dad, I whispered, moving closer to it. Is that really you? Are you still in there? The creature standing on two legs was covered in thick, wiry fur. Gray streaked with white, just like my dad's beard. And when I looked into his eyes, I could see something familiar there. A glimmer in them. But then the beast was snapping its jaws and aggressively growling at me, pulling on its chains as it tried to break free once again. It was too much to look at. Too much to bear after the news I had been given. All of this was too much. It was making me feel sick just thinking about how much my life had changed in a few short hours. I slowly backed away and went towards the fire, grateful when the sound of growling began to recede and eventually went away altogether, drowned out by the crackling of the flames and the wind in the trees. The bonfire was guttering, despite my dad's excellent construction of it. I got the feeling I'd been out for a while, judging by the moon and the stars in the sky above. At least it was still going enough that I could coax it back to life. I fed a few more logs onto it and some smaller kindling beneath that, then began to blow on the embers until the dry wood caught a light. Within a few minutes it was roaring again, and I was holding my hands up to the blaze to warm them. They were still shaking, and my teeth were still chattering from fear and numb shock but I was starting to settle down a little bit. My father was a werewolf. It didn't seem real, but there it was. There he was. All I needed to do was look over at him to confirm I wasn't dreaming. This was real. I decided to dig around in my dad's bag to see if he'd brought anything to drink. Sure enough, there were hot dogs and cold soda, just waiting for me to find them. Cracking one open, I glanced at my dad the dogman, out of the corner of my eye. He had settled back against the tree, as if resigned to his fate. But I thought I could sense an occasional movement, as if he were still testing the restraints. Something else caught my eye at the bottom of the bag, and I took it out to examine it in the light of the fire. Journal, the cover of the book read. A sticky note was attached to the front of it, which I pulled off to read in the light. Hope this helps, Dad. It was his journal, I realized, and he wanted me to read it. I opened it and began to read from the first page, as my father struggled and growled in his chains a little ways away. Still trembling with terror, I held the pages close to the fire and began to read, hoping to learn the secrets of my family's curse. Instead, what I found was a record of my father's life and a startling picture of what my own grim existence would soon look like. January 10, 2001. It finally happened. For years he warned me, and yet still I was not prepared for this. How could anyone hope to be prepared for this? Those people. So many died by my own hands. The newspaper called it an animal attack, and that is not too far from the truth. When I am in that form I am all instinct and anger, completely unable to form rational thoughts. That does not excuse my lack of preparation. My father told me to prepare, but I used my grief as an excuse to forget. I will go to hell for the things I have done. There is no doubt in my mind about that. 
Heaven has no place for a man who can tear apart a woman with his bare teeth. Next time I will be more careful. For the next few weeks, I will need to devise a plan. I will need to speak to Uncle Horace. He promised to help me, but I do not know how he will manage to do so if he suffers from the same affliction. Still, at the very least, he may be able to give me some advice. Until next time. Giha. I read a few more pages, then realized the fire needed to be fed, and stood up to grab more wood. As soon as I did I heard a loud growling noise from behind me, where my father was chained to the tree. He pulled against the restraints again, and I thought I saw something crack, a piece of the tree splintering and coming loose. But then he settled back again, and I realized it was nothing of consequence, just a piece of bark that had come loose. Or so I thought. Asterisk. After stoking the fire and letting it burn for a while, warming my hands against the heat of the flames, I settled back into reading. February 9th, 2001. It worked. The chains held fast and the manacles were large enough to keep my wrists secure without injuring myself. My arms are sore and my shoulders ache, but at least my conscience is clean, knowing I did everything in my power to prevent disaster. Damn this belt. I wish I could get rid of it. I wish I could just throw it in the ocean and let the tide take it away, but Uncle Horace warned me not to. If I do then someone else will find it, and who knows what they might do with this power if left unchecked? The world would be safer without us in it. Giha. It was sad to think that my father had help, but I would have none. If this condition was really passed on to me, I would be the last one in our family to be afflicted with it. I had no kids and wasn't planning on having any. And my great-uncle Horace and all of the other men in my family had passed away. I was the last man in the Hamburg line, and that meant the family secret would die with me. Assuming I could keep it a secret, it also meant that once my father passed away there would be no one around to help me with this curse. No one to guide me like Uncle Horace had guided him. The journal I was holding was all I had, aside from the advice of my father. And he didn't have much time left by the sounds of it. Something made a loud cracking sound in the forest behind me, and I stood up and turned around. I saw the vague outline of a person, just a smudge of shadow among the trees, and then heard the air whistling behind me as something large and heavy came swinging at my head. I don't remember it hitting me, only the pain I felt afterwards. Asterisk. The fire was in front of me when I blinked my eyes open, but the flames were blurry and ill-defined. My head was spinning and my ears were ringing, as I tried to focus on the man in front of me who was speaking. He snapped his fingers once, twice, three times, as if trying to get me to pay attention. There we go. Wakey, wakey, he said, grinning. Nice job, fellow hunter. Sorry to blindside you like that, but we had to be sure. Rumor has it there are some sick freaks around here who are friendly with these creatures. Ugh, I groaned, trying to form words. What are? Who are you? I looked around to see more men nearby, all dressed in camouflage. Hunters, he said. Dogman hunters. Shit. I looked over to where my dad was chained up. There were two men taking pictures of him with their cell phones while he growled and snapped his teeth at them. Nowhere near as accomplished as you though, the man's friend said. I've seen a few of him, but never caught one and chained it up. Damn dude, how'd you manage that? I tried to think up a lie. My head was still spinning though and I was having trouble thinking straight. Hey Dave, check this out. One of the guys near my father said, pointing at the belt around his waist. I stood up on shaky legs and wandered over to join the group of them. Yeah, it's weird. He was wearing that belt when I found him, I muttered, trying to think of what words to say on the fly. How'd you manage to subdue this beast, brother? One of the men asked. He was tall, with a long black beard. 
wearing plaid and a black jacket. Almost looks like a prior arrangement to me. The group of them turned to look at me suspiciously. A prior arrangement? I asked. What's that even mean? This brought more murmurs from the group, and I heard a few unkind whispers about my true allegiance. Where's your gear? Your rifle and all your equipment? A louder grumbling began to rise up from the men, as a few of them began to move towards me. Is this your journal? A voice from behind me asked, reading through it aloud. All of my family secrets suddenly being spoken out into the world, for this whole group of men to hear. He's one of them, someone said. We can't let him go. He's a leakin, a beast, from hell. Two of them grabbed me from behind while the one holding the journal marched over, waving the book in his hand. I asked you a question, he said, smacking me on the forehead with the leather-bound book. Is this yours? I stared at him defiantly, the whole time watching my father out of the corner of my eye. He was still pulling on the restraints, testing them, straining against them with all of his might. The tree was bending against his efforts, the trunk splintering and cracking. My father's, I spat, looking behind him fully now, at the creature chained to the tree. It belongs to my father. There was grumbling amongst the group members, and then finally one of them spoke up loudly. We'll kill them both. Even if he's not one of them yet, he's got it in his blood. It's only a matter of time before he goes through the transformation. Grab him. Don't let him get away. I turned to run, but it was too late. They were already on me. One of the men tackled me, pinning me to the ground while another approached with a pistol. He cocked it, then aimed at my head. Silver bullets, mate. Made him myself. The cold steel of the barrel was pressed up against my forehead, digging into my skin. Any last words, Leakin? I tried to speak, but all that came out was a whimper. I wasn't ready to die. There was so much more I wanted to do in life. All of my dreams and plans for the future, all of my brightest memories and the faces of my loved ones flashed before my eyes and I waited for the bullet that would end my life. Guess not. I felt the man tense up as he was about to pull the trigger, and then something broke. A loud crack erupted from nearby. Chains rattled and shook. Steel snapped, and then there was screaming from all around. I opened my eyes to look around and saw a bloodbath. The men who had been surrounding me were being slaughtered by a gray streak, that moved faster than anything I'd seen before. It was a blur of movement, stopping for a second to disembowel a hunter, then swiftly moving on to the next. Blood erupted into the air to my left and then my right, a fountain, a geyser, as men's throats were ripped out and their arms detached and they tried to fight back ineffectually. It was like watching ants try to fight against a man. They stood no chance. The man who had been ready to shoot me was the last one alive. He held his gun with both hands, trying to keep it steady in his trembling hands. Each time the creature paused he tensed up and got ready to fire, but an instant later it was moving again, a blur streaking through the air, reappearing somewhere else before he could get a shot off. I realized the creature was toying with him, as the beast grinned, showing its many long, sharp teeth. When he finally did manage to shoot at the beast, each bullet missed Wild. He backed away, stumbling and falling over a tree trunk. The man crab walked backwards, trying to find the gun he had dropped among the fallen leaves. The giant wolf creature came toward him, growling low and deep. Stay back, the man shouted. Finding his gun, I'll shoot you. I'll get back. Get the fuck back. He pulled the trigger again. It fired once, then made several dry clicking noises. As he continued to squeeze the trigger, the revolver empty. The creature lunged at him. 
The man's screams were loud and awful, and I turned my head away so I wouldn't be forced to watch. Eventually he was quiet and could no longer make a noise. For a few minutes, all I could hear was the wet sounds of blood being spilled and teeth working to chew through muscle and bone. When I opened my eyes and looked up, there was the face of a large wolf in front of me, staring right at me. I couldn't help but notice those teeth, long and white, coming to points that could crush a skull. For a moment I thought I would die, that this form of my father would not recognize me. Its giant, bloody maw came down towards me, and I cringed backwards, the smell of coppery entrails wafting out from its gullet. But instead of teeth snapping shut on my face, a soft, oversized tongue licked my cheek. And then the warmth of an enormous dog settled down on the forest floor beside me. His breathing was too fast and too heavy, I realized, as I felt the warmth of blood soaking through my shirt. The hunter's last bullet had gotten him. I saw the wound as I sat up to look at him beside me. His eyes were wide and locked with mine, his mouth open and panting. Dad. No. I stroked the soft fur of his cheeks and pressed my face against his. I kissed his forehead and watched as he closed his eyes and his breathing slowed, then stopped. After a long while I stood up to find a bloodbath all around me dead hunters whose families and friends would soon be looking for them. I threw their phones into the blazing fire, hoping the pictures they had taken of my father had not been uploaded to the cloud. I looked down to see the journal had been burnt to embers in the fire. The hunter had dropped it into the blaze before he was torn to shreds. One last insult. One last attack. I had nothing left to show me the way now. I went back home to get a shovel and began to dig. It took a long, long time to make a pit big enough to bury all those bodies. When I was done, I felt exhausted, but I knew there was still more to do. I took my dad's belt and fixed it around my waist, sending it through the loops of my pants and then looking down at the silver wolf head on the buckle. As I reached down to pick up my father's lifeless corpse, now human again, I found I had more strength than ever before. His body weighed almost nothing. I knew how to get home, and I carried my father back to see the crying eyes of my mother waiting at the door. As if she had known all along. Asterisk. It's been almost a month since all this happened. My dad's funeral was a couple weeks back, and it surprised me again how little of my family is left still alive. No men were there to see him off. Only the women of the family remain. They complimented me on how well I was handling everything, how mature I'd become, and they said how good I look wearing my father's old belt, that ancient family heirloom which nobody wants, as if it's cursed. I have no one to help me now, no one to guide me, but I've been preparing for the next full moon. I found a sturdy tree, bigger than the last, deeper in the wilderness of the forest, and I've fixed it with manacles and thick steel chains. I'm watching the calendar, ready for the next full moon. I'm terrified of what will come next, but after reading my father's journal, I refuse to make the same mistake he did. I may be a monster now, but I will not allow myself to turn into a cold-blooded killer, unless I chance upon another dogman hunter, wandering alone in the forest. Fifth story. Think wolf, wolf, wolf. I want him before he wants me. I am 23 years old and sipping mint juleps from red plastic cups when I see him. His polo shirt is stained with the brown of a chocolate stout, and his hair smells of vague lotion and barber soap, and the seams of his shirt are pulled too tight against his chest. I finish my drink sloppily and find him standing in a circle around beer-stained playing cards, and when I give him my name and number, and I see the lights dance in his eyes, I know he is mine. When he first holds me in his arms, we have been dating for twelve hours and I want him. We sit in the squeaking rocking seat of a Ferris wheel, 
and watch the city lights flash like fireflies beneath us. I tell him about wildflowers and macro photography, and he tells me about hydroelectric dams. Then I tell him to stop talking. He asks if I believe in ghosts. No, I say there are no ghosts here. He wraps his arms around me, and I taste the soft smile on his lips. When he takes me home that evening, he opens the door like a gentleman, and he shakes my father's hand with a firm grip, and I know we will marry. We do, or we will, but first, he takes me camping. We take small sips from water bottles as we ascend. The backpack rubs heavy on my shoulders. My legs ache, and the sun brings blistering red on not sunscreen painted forearms. In the heat of summer, the sultry air is thick with mosquitoes and tastes of earthworms. Here, a kingfisher dances on branches and watches the river for the flash tail of a trout. There, a porcupine snoozes in the curled lump of a spruce branch. We pitch our tin atop pine needles and moss. Do you like the moonlight? He asks. Yes, I say. Do you like the crickets and the frogs? He asks. Yes, stop talking. Tell me you love me. Love me. He does. The bushes stir. Coupled in his arms, I wake. Hear the chittering and groaning of rocks and leaves and the world. A twig snaps. An owl hoots and flees and leaves the camp in stunted silence. Did you hear that? It's nothing. Wait, I think. When the claws dig into the plastic of the tent, I scream. He jumps to a crouch and reaches for a hunting knife. But the claws have done their work and the eyes of the creature are red, red, red. It howls, growls, and the sound from its throat is twisted and beautiful and terrible. It lunges, and its claws bring a spurt of fresh blood, and I scream and scream and kick and bite and scratch. It does not matter. At the end, he is bloody and his throat is ripped raw, and I hold his hand until the last, until he is warm but unmoving and the floor of the tent is slicked with blood. The creature he stabbed fled into the night. A bite mark on my shoulder stings and burns and throbs with pain not natural, and I know that I am forever broken. They tell me about lines. Two, they say, means pregnant. When I tell them my would-be husband is dead with a ripped throat in a closed casket they smile and give condolences and say things they think matters. Nothing matters. The moonlight starts to hurt and makes my skin crawl like a hundred spiders are beneath my skin, burning, pulsing. The moonlight burns, I say. Yes, they say. I'm sorry. Hashtag. At home, I paint the crib a beautiful pastel blue and read parenting books until I can stack them twelve high on the counter. I take pictures from the walls, share photographs with my would-have-been step-parents. They hold their tears with mine and we go through scrapbooks, baby photographs, embarrassing prom pictures. You were his first, they say. You were special. They say they'll help with the baby. I say thank you and goodbye and think, why couldn't the creature have taken me instead? When my son arrives, he brings a pain I cannot describe through words alone. The doctors pump my spine with an intravenous drip and tell me to push, to breathe. They hold my hand. My father and stepfather wait outside and make small talk in the way only wounded parents can. Please, I tell my son, behave, be kind to me. He is not. In the end, my lips are bloody and my legs lose feeling and the doctor hands me the small lump of flesh that cries and coos. I hold his hand and his small fingers curl around my thumb and at that moment, I know he is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. There might be problems, the doctors say, complications. My son is covered in a thin veneer of fur. My shoulder pulses with phantom pain. The virus might have spread to him, they say. He might not be fully human. I don't care. I love him, I love him, I love him. My son grows like a pup. In a year, 
He can walk and run and speak in short stunted sentences. He stacks blocks in his crib and giggles whenever the top block falls. He sleeps curled in a blanket, and he bats his hands at the mobile above him. Your father would have loved you. I say, he would have, he would have. He says mama and mama. I force the pills down his throat and mine whenever the moonlight is strongest. He tells me about school. The class made finger-painted pictures, and I hang them on the fridge. I tell him he is talented and brilliant, even though the image looks like a monstrous tree. There are streaks of red in the stomach of the stick figures. The sun in the corner is colored silver. I ask him if he is hungry, and he nods. I feed him steak and cut, and season the raw cubes with salt and pepper. He says he wants chicken. We eat it raw. They come for him in the daylight. They take him on his walk home, and he squirms, and he screams, and I tell myself he fought them to the last, though I cannot know the truth. They say money, money, money. They say pills, pills. I tell them to go fuck themselves. When I speak to the police, I beg and plead and tell them every detail I think will matter. Then I pace the floor of his bedroom, count the colored pills in the bottle, and check the calendar. One week until the full moon. I stare at the magnets on the wall. I picture the monster in my mind's eye. The glowing eyes and dagger white claws that ripped and tore and took my husband from me. I'd like to think the beast was scared, afraid, not in control. I'd like to think it had no choice. I'd like to think it died slowly after my husband plunged the hunting knife into its still beating heart. But I know it survived because no steel can kill it. I tell them about money. I don't have it yet, I say. I won't have it for a week. I ask to speak to my son, and they put the phone against his ear. He says, Mommy, I'm scared. I ask if they've been feeding him, and he says yes, though I do not know if he means cooked meat or raw, and I do not know if the men understand what he is, what we are, and what we can become. I have never seen my son changed. I do not know if he even knows what the raw moonlight will do to him. I need to buy time. I need to breathe. I need to think. None of the twelve parenting books stacked on the counter have prepared me for the inevitable fear of losing a child. I've lost one man, and I cannot, will not lose another. The police will never know the truth. I learn about moonlight. Beneath my skin is a thousand needle pricks. It waits in my blood, my bones. It stalks my footsteps and hunger beneath my eyes. It waits. I pull a hood around my head and travel to the park. They come with my son wrapped in a shawl. They come with guns. I do not think guns can stop me. Think blood flesh rip tear. Think wolf wolf wolf. I hold my son in my arms. He cries because he does not understand. He asks what happened, and why the men screamed, and why it hurts so bad. I tell him to drink water, and take the pills and wait. I tell him that I love him. I wipe the blood from my chin. I rip the bullets from my arm with a pair of tweezers. They go plink plink on the tile, and I wipe the blood away with a rag. I'm not sure whose blood runs innocently down the sink. I tell my son I love him, and I hold him. And I tell him his father would be proud, that he was so brave. I tell myself those things too. I try to believe them, even when I cannot. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section. And like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.